Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. This tutorial is about creating time-lapse videos. Okay, and we're all going to be looking at the capture side of the process, how to best capture the frames, and also how to um, put those frames together to make a movie in Adobe software. That's the post-production side. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, just a quick overview of if you're new to time-lapse. Uh, movies are typically captured between 24 and 30 frames per second. This gives us the illusion of continuous movement or real time. If we increase the interval, however, between each frame captured and then play the movie back at normal speed, 24 or 30 frames per second, we're going to accelerate time or cause time to lapse. An example of this is if we were capturing one frame every second instead of 24 frames every second and we do that for a period of four minutes if we play the movie back at 24 frames per second four minutes of normal time will be compressed into just 10 seconds of movie any people seen in the streets will be moving around as fast as cars and any clouds that were moving quite slowly in the sky will be racing across the sky. And this is how we create drama from um, movement or activities that seemingly take forever to unfold. They unfold really quickly and that creates for very exciting movies. Okay, so we're going to need a bit of hardware in order to capture these movies. Uh, essential equipment obviously is your camera, uh, but we're going to need to keep the camera very still uh, so we don't give uh, people seasickness when, we're, when they're watching those uh, time-lapse movies playback. So we're going to need that tripod. Okay, and uh, the second most important piece of equipment is called an intervalometer. Okay, this is a, just a fancy name for a, a device that will just uh, trigger the camera off at set intervals without us actually holding the camera and thereby shaking the camera. Now you can order these quite cheaply online from uh, places such as eBay for sometimes less than $20. Just make sure you order one with a connector that is suitable for your camera, whether it be a Sony or a Canon, etc. Now Nikon owners are a little bit uh, fortunate in this regard in that their cameras have a built-in interval timer. Don't confuse this with any time-lapse app that you might see in the camera. Okay, you're actually going to be looking for the interval timer. A lot of the apps that do time-lapse in uh, modern cameras, they actually make the movie in the camera. And we want a little bit more creative control in post-production for this. And obviously, we're going to get this creative control inside of Lightroom and Photoshop CC, which will work hand-in-hand -hand for this uh, uh, tu um, tutorial. Now, there are a couple of alternatives uh, if you don't want to order uh, an intervalometer. We could actually, for instance, if your camera is a Wi-Fi enabled camera, we could download a free app, um, perhaps for an Android phone. Uh, there's a little illustration on the top left there. Um, there is also um, a, an app called Trigger Trap, which you can buy uh, for your Android or um, iOS camera. And uh, this uh, allows, you, uh, allows you to connect your phone, your smartphone, directly to the camera via a cable. However, that dongle or cable is going to cost as much as a standalone intervalometer. The trigger trap, however, has a few more features that allow you to trigger um, the, um, the camera in, in you know, quite creative ways, such as clapping your hand or distance traveled, etc. So that might be uh, something that you might want to look at later. For those people who own Sony cameras, the newer Sony cameras have um, the ability to uh, download apps as if it's like a smartphone itself. And uh, we can download a time-lapse app uh, from the Sony Play Memories camera store, which will uh, act as our intervalometer. Okay, now these are optional extras, but it, um, sometimes they make uh, the, um, the um, process of capturing uh, um, time-lapse uh, stills um, a lot easier and faster, uh, such as a memory card. Uh, choose a quick one. Um, we're going to be firing um, shots off at um, uh, a rapid rate and uh, we don't want the uh, camera locking up because it's uh, busy writing files to your card. So choose a fast one. Class 10 is recommended. Uh, a spare battery. Um, obviously if you're going out for the whole day shooting time-lapse you'll possibly drain your battery um, in the first uh, how many 
hundreds of shots but uh, you, if you want to be shooting all day certainly take a spare battery fully charged. Um, obviously we don't want to be putting all of these hundreds and hundreds of files onto our main hard drive especially if we're using a laptop computer so I would uh, typically use a USB 3 external drive for this. Um, the other thing that you uh, possibly want uh, to give us ourselves again a little bit more creative freedom are these things down here called ND filters. They're like sunglasses for lenses. Uh, it gives us a little bit more creative freedom about choice of shutter speed and I'll talk more about that later. And this one uh, down in the bottom right hand corner here is a very specialized piece of equipment which you can certainly live without but if you're wanting to shoot time lapse through windows say hotel windows looking out at uh, nice uh, twilight scenes you're actually going to be recording the uh, interior lights of your room or hotel if you don't have this little device called the lens skirt it just uh, shrouds the lens and then suckers onto the window so we're only recording um, the lights that are on the the correct side of the window, uh, not the room that we're standing in. Okay. Okay. First thing that I do, uh, I'm, I'm in love with shooting uh, time lapses of landscapes. Uh, I think it's a, a really pleasant thing to do, like fishing in the early morning uh, for some people. Okay. It's, uh, I, but I scout my location from home before I even uh, arrive there. I, I'm typically know what to expect and there's a couple of apps that are on my computer that make this possible. Uh, the first is uh, Photographer's Ephemeris. This is actually a web app. You don't download it to your computer. Um, it is, uh, using Google Maps is we can track uh, the sun and the moon in relation to the scene that we're wanting to photograph from. So we're less surprised. We know when twilight is occurring and we know when uh, at the position and height of the sun at any particular time of the day. Uh, once we're out on the location, there is an app uh, called Sunseeker, and this uh, allows uh, it um, a remarkable flexibility. It actually opens uh, the camera on your smart device, whether it's a tablet or phone, and allows you to uh, see where the sun will be at any particular time of the day. And so you're very clear when the best time of day to return to the beach or the urban landscape actually is. Okay, a few tips for image capture. Um, you can obviously play this back um, a couple of times if you if you forget a couple of these, but uh, some of them are a little bit obvious, but I'll state them anyway. And that is is to format your card uh, so there's no uh, previous images from a previous day on your card. Obviously, we're going to be shooting hundreds of images, so we want an empty card. And just make sure you're work, working with a fully charged battery so you're not disappointed just as the um, ac action is getting to um, the most dramatic and your battery battery goes flat. Okay, our next one is to set the capture aspect ratio, that's the shape of the frames, to 16.9, which is widescreen HD or full HD format. Okay, uh, sensors uh, tend to be um, in 3.2, so the shape is actually a little bit different from the camera and the output movie format that we're capturing or outputting to. Now, uh, it's uh, opt optimal, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's optimal to shoot with a shutter speed of a 50th of a second or longer or slower. Okay, um, and also to use an aperture that is tip uh, better to be wider than f8 such as 5, 6 or 4. The reason for this is if you've got uh, any dust on your camera sensor uh, you don't want to be spotting um, 100 or 200 or 500 frames in post-production because of those annoying little dust spots. Those dust spots are actually hard to see with apertures wider than f8 and so um, if you've got a clean sensor then obviously we can be stopping down but if you're not too sure then definitely use the wider aperture I would recommend shooting in a uh, raw quality setting, especially when the, uh, high, uh, the scene is uh, high contrast. This uh, prevents us from clipping either the shadows or highlights and allows us to do a little bit more in post and again I'll talk about that on the next slide. Okay, ensure the camera and tripod are free from vibration. Typically you don't want to be recording um, a time-lapse sequence on a boardwalk where people are running past the tripod. All of the vibration will be passing through the tripod and create a very shaky looking movie. And uh, uh, for DSLR shooters, when you start recording the time-lapse sequence, uh, cover the viewfinder or eyepiece um, so that no light is entering that um, viewfinder. It can lead to a flickering video. 
Okay, so um, for uh, cannon shooters shooting in RAW, you actually have the choice of the small RAW f file format. Uh, there you go, Canon have something um, in uh, that uh, b is better than Nikon in this regard. Um, I often shoot, however, in crop mode. I have a full frame camera and I sometimes shoot in APS-C crop mode. And this gives me a, a, raw, a smaller RAW file format because we don't need 36 megapixels when shooting time lapse. Okay, so um, okay, this is why we're shooting in uh, the raw file format. The image you're looking at here is actually the same frame uh, before processing and after processing. And you couldn't do this with a, a movie file that you recorded in a DSLR or mirrorless camera. Uh, basically, the thing would fall apart. Okay, so um, but we can be very aggressive in editing with our raw file formats, and this gives us a lot of um, uh, flexibility to be creative in post production. Okay, so choosing an interval. Uh, the best way to think about this is do I shoot at you know, one frame per second or um, one frame every minute or how do I choose that interval? The best way of thinking about this is try and think about the event that's about to happen, whether it's um, the tide coming in or you want the clouds tracking from the left hand side of the frame to the right side of the frame and sort of try and guess how many minutes that you want to record over. Now if you're wanting a 10 second clip um, as the result of your time lapse then um, 240 frames you'll be firing off uh, one frame every second if that whole action or drama is over in four minutes. If however uh, the so the tide is coming in it's going to be um, uh, unfolding a lot more slowly or the clouds are moving very slowly then you might want to increase the interval. Uh, for instance if you're firing one frame off every five seconds then you're going to be recording for 20 minutes but still end up with that 10 second clip in playback. Okay, so don't get hung up on that. If in doubt, just um, shoot at one frame per second and then uh, modify that as you get a little bit more experienced. Uh, choosing a shutter speed, I did say 1 50th of a second or slower. Uh, 1 50th of a second is the typical sort of shutter speed that Hollywood uses when making movies at 24 frames per second. If you think about it, they're actually taking a 50% slice of real time. Okay, that shutter is actually open for 50% of all of the time it's recording. Okay, and if we're getting a little bit of motion blur because 50 of a second is not terribly fast, um, then and that just allows the motion to flow seamlessly between the frames when played back. Okay, so um, if we uh, have to record uh, shutter speeds faster than a 50th of a second, you can create what's called choppy video. It, um, um, we're recording less of real time, but and also the action is frozen in every frame. So we're just getting a little bit of stutter uh, in, in the frames as they pass through. Okay. Okay, now the only problem with um, choosing in, um, shutter speed slower than a 50th of a second is uh, sometimes uh, the ambient lighting conditions are too bright. And this is where these neutral density filters uh, come in handy. Now when I'm shooting um, at an interval of say um, one frame every two seconds, if I'm going to record 50% of everything that's happening, I'm going to be using a, a shutter speed of one second. And this does often require that I put an ND filter in front of the lens to reduce the amount of light so I don't overexpose each frame. Okay, now if you're not too sure what sort of ND filter, uh, they come in different strengths and um, typically a good starting point would be say an ND16 or so, um, maybe an ND32 uh, if you're shooting in very sunny conditions. Okay, there are also things called variable ND filters that allow the filter to get darker as you turn that filter. So just uh, check those out in your local camera store. Okay, choosing an image mode. Now, by far the best mode for shooting time lapse is manual. Manual everything. Okay, manual focus. Okay, you don't want the uh, focus hunting backwards and forwards between each frame. Okay, manual white balance. Uh, you don't want the white balance to change just because something red appeared for two frames, confusing your camera. Uh, manual exposure. If a cloud momentarily passes in front of the sun, you don't want the, the aperture and shutter speed to change um, very quickly just for one frame because that will create a bit of a flash in your video. Uh, and uh, we also keep ISO to manual as well. The only exception to this is for uh, maybe newcomers to um, uh, 
time lapse. If you're recording a sunrise or sunset, you may want to uh, choose auto white balance and aperture priority. And uh, that's so you, uh, the um, things uh, will naturally progress darker or lighter as needed and the color temperature or white balance will follow to suit. Okay, now we're getting into the post-production side. Okay, so I'll shift from uh, my slides to um, a real demo here um, using Lightroom. And we're going to be doing a post-production in Lightroom. The first step, obviously, is to import your um, RAW files. If you've been shooting in RAW, you can do this with JPEGs, of course. Um, but just import them um, into uh, Lightroom so we can get started. Now, um, just in fact, I forget to tell you, uh, we are going to remember to crop to 16.9 before export. Okay, so let's jump over. I've got um, uh, Flinders uh, station here. Uh, this has already been optimized. Okay, let's just go into grid view and you can see all of these frames have been synchronized. They're all the same exposure and same color. But I'm going to select all of them. That's uh, Command A on a Mac or Control A on a PC. And then uh, we're just going to uh, reset those. At the bottom of the Quick Develop, we have a reset all. This will take them back to their raw, original raw state. And because obviously Lightroom is a non-destructive editing program, so we never actually uh, permanently adjust any pixels. Uh, no pixels were damaged in the making of this movie. Okay, so let's just um, go into loop view. Uh, just press the E key. Uh, this is the raw state. Obviously, if we're going to make any changes, you can make some to the quick develop, but you've got a lot more flexibility in the develop module. So just press the D on the keyboard or hit the develop module here to take this in. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to do first is this is taken with a very wide angle lens. Um, and uh, we're getting a lot of converging verticals here. Now the term for correcting those converging verticals is called keystoning and we can do that in the lens corrections panel. Um, just before I correct those I just want to make sure the enable profile corrections and remove chromatic aberration are checked. Now if you are used to the um, upright mode uh, you'll know that auto uh, does allow us to um, correct or keystone images automatically. But when we're synchronizing across hundreds of files, one of the things that we won't synchronize across is the upright feature. So we really have to switch that off and do this part manually. So I'm just going to come into the manual here, uh, click on the, the vertical, and I'm just going to um, shift and down arrow key to drop that down 30, and you'll see my verticals are now straight. In order to remove this white canvas area, I'll just click on Constrain Crop. I'll then come into the uh, Crop um, panel here, and I'll switch from the original aspect ratio, which is uh, 3.2 or 2.3, uh, to 16.9, uh, which is our output or widescreen full HD aspect ratio. We can move that crop me marquee around. If you did this in camera, they'll actually come into the camera uh, in this uh, aspect ratio, so you won't have to do uh, this um, in this post-production stage. So I'll just hit that uh, crop marquee again uh, in order to apply that. Now you're not limited, uh, unlike editing movies in Lightroom, you're not limited to uh, only some of the adjustments. We can use all of the adjustments in the develop uh, panel here to adjust our stills that will result in a movie. Okay, for instance, I can use highlights and I can add shadows, open those out so we can see into those shadows. And obviously this is the advantage of the, of the raw file format. I'll just drop the, um, the color temperatures a little bit warm and I'll make the colors a lot uh, richer when using the vibrant slider. I'll come into my HSL panel and just make the luminance of those blues darker. See how much flexibility we've got in creating a very uh, stylized um, or uh, post-produced uh, movie. Okay, and now we're simply just coming back into the grid view, select all of my files and hit sync settings. And for those who love keyboard shortcuts, you'd be looking at Command Shift S on a Mac or Control Shift S on a PC. And uh, that's the post-producing inside of um, um, Lightroom. Uh, we just need, in order to hand this project over to Photoshop CC now, we'll just hit the export button. And uh, I've got a preset here called Time Lapse. And uh, you'll see my settings here. I'm choosing a folder later option. 
I'm going to choose custom name sequence. This is um, important to rename and or renumber the files if we've gone in and deleted any of the frames because perhaps somebody walked in front of the camera we do need to renumber. We can't have any gaps in the numerical sequence. I'm coming out as JPEG sRGB which is appropriate for screen viewing quality 8 okay uh, that's good enough quality unless we were going to post produce the movie a second time in which case we might raise that to 90 or 100 we're going to hit resize to fit these are the pixel dimensions of full HD which is 1920 pixels wide and 1080 or 1080 pixels high the resolution isn't that important to be honest so it doesn't really matter entering anything in there and because we're coming down from quite large uh, megapixel sizes it is uh, prudent to sharpen for screen um, just so that we get a nice crisp looking video at the end of the day and then I'm just going to hit export because uh, I've um, being asked um, where I want to save that was part of my preset I'm just going to go to the desktop hit new folder and then I would name the folder and then we would process those files I'm just going to cancel out because uh, like all good presenters uh, I've got one I've already um, prepared earlier okay so let's jump over to Photoshop now obviously if we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files to process from Lightroom you're probably going to want to go and have a cup of coffee or put the kettle on because it might take uh, five or ten minutes to export all of those files from Lightroom especially if you've got a, a very high megapixel camera and you've been shooting in RAW okay so here's a project that I'll come back to a little bit later but right now we want to uh, edit uh, that file we were just looking at so I'm going to come to the file menu and we'll choose um, open okay going too far open and uh, we're going to browse to um, uh, some exports that I've created here's my Flinders Street Station 1080 you if you wanting to create smaller movies you could entertain the idea of perhaps 720 as your size of export uh, typical size is 1280 by 720 we could export from Lightroom this would create a smaller video uh, also a smaller file size to upload to YouTube if we don't want the full HD I'm going to make a full HD however I click on the first image in the folder do not attempt to open all images into Photoshop if you've got thousands of files you will crash Photoshop by doing that okay so just the first file click on it hit image sequence okay probably never seen that one before if you've not done time-lapse image sequence that's your time-lapse option there and then select open just before Photoshop opens the image sequence into Photoshop it's going to ask you for your frame rate this is where you get to choose uh, maybe 24 uh, 25 um, or even a faster higher frame rate such as 50 or 60 uh, 24 25 30 um, the most common okay so I'm going to go for just for 25 and then select OK okay now quite quickly I can just uh, you see I've got the timeline panel open at the base of my user interface here it's good having it on the base of the user interface rather than stacked with maybe your layers and channels panel just because you need that width over time here okay so typically we get to the movie file so the layer has got a little movie icon there and it's in a video group now we can add sound um, to movie obviously we're creating stills as this is a, um, a silent movie and obviously if we need it to play back with sound we could add, be adding sound later maybe in iMovie or Premiere Pro or Final Cut but we could just add um, sound now just by clicking on the plus sign here uh, find an audio track I'll go to my music folder uh, click on uh, my song and click open and that adds this green audio track okay let's just um, um, move that down we're just uh, making these timelines a little bit shorter we're not actually affecting the time it's just so I can see the end of the timeline and I can just click and drag that because that that sound file is much longer than this clip I've opened up so I'm just going to drag that and it'll, it'll find the edge it's got almost like magnetic attraction to the end so those will be now the, the right um, uh, duration it matches okay 
Okay, so we've got this and we can now hit uh, the, the playback option. Now the first time we play back, Photoshop wants to cache each frame and it won't be able to play back at real time the first time we play through. And so we click play and we're perhaps only playing back at seven, possibly eight frames per second for that time-lapse movie. And what you'll see is this little uh, turquoise line appearing above the timeline. And that's saying, and I've now cached each frame. And so the second time I play back, I can play back at the full 25 frames per second. Okay, now we might, we can also do a little bit of creative stuff in here. We can add fades to this movie. We could add a fade with black at the beginning and we could add a fade with black at the end. Uh, and so now what will happen, and I'll just click, is uh, this movie will fade in over time and uh, we're, it can be completely clear and then get darker as it fades out. Okay, these are optional. We can also click on these fades and make them shorter or longer if we require. Uh, the option we have with the um, audio is we can actually, um, we, we don't need to mute audio, that's only if you're um, recording videos in your camera, but there is no audio attached to the movie file. Okay, but we can actually choose a fade in and a fade out, and that will just make the music just come in gradually uh, and fade out gradually. Okay, so that's a useful feature there. Okay, so um, now um, we're probably just ready to export this movie as a clip to uh, our desktop and um, maybe compile that with other time-lapse clipses that we're capturing. Okay, there's a little icon down at the bottom, which is our export icon, or I can come to the file menu, choose export and render video. Now typically there's not a lot to do in this dialog, although it looks busy, um, except just to um, a name our file. Typically by default it will choose the um, size of the document, which is our 19, 20, 10, 80, uh, a high quality, okay, H.264, which is a high quality video format, and um, yeah, so it's pretty much all done. All we need to do is pretty much name it and hit a render. And uh, obviously, again, that might take uh, a few minutes, depending on um, how quick your um, computer is. I've got a, a dual-core i7 processor, so it's ripping through this um, movie production really quite quickly. Okay, and um, then I'll just come over to my desktop. Okay, so I'll just uh, try and find that on my desktop. And... Uh, and uh, open that movie file up. I'll just squash it so it comes into your window frame there. And there's my time lapse. How easy is that? Okay, so let's look at uh, a couple of other creative things we can do because we're not going to leave off there. Okay, let's open up another time lapse. Okay, I'll come back into Photoshop first. File, open. Okay, so let's come up to my exports folder. And I'll choose a time-lapse sequence that I captured in Port Douglas in Queensland. And I'll click on the top frame as I did before, Image Sequence, and then select Open. Again, 25 frames per second, select Open again. Okay, and here's my movie. And what you'll see is these uh, sailing boats will track across the frame. And I was quite lucky on this one. Another boat comes in, traveling in the opposite direction. And then double look, we actually get three people um, on jet skis just to finish off the movie. Okay, and that's exactly the time you don't want your battery to go flat or your card to fill up. Okay, so um, I've got um, a good um, uh, five second clip here. Uh, I'm just creating shorter clips for this demonstration. Typically I do like uh, 10 second clips. It gives me a little bit of uh, flexibility to um, combine clips together and do crossfades and other creative stuff. Okay, what are we going to do that's creative that's different from in this movie? Okay, let's just come over to our layers panel and you'll see the little movie icon. If I move to the right on the layer itself and right click and come down, I can convert this um, um, movie into a smart object. 
Uh, you'll notice that the timeline goes from blue to purple. Uh, no, that's not the creative bit. Uh, we can actually click on the little flyer menu at the end of the timeline and our options actually change here. Okay, uh, previously we had the options maybe to um, uh, mute something or speed something up or slow something down. But um, typically we control that by our interval or our frame rate. We don't typically in a time-lapse movie change the speed of the movie um, here. But uh, once we've converted it to a smart object we get a different option and we get the option to do pan and zoom in post. Even though the camera is on a fixed tripod we can simulate a, um, a zoom or a pan in post. Okay, so and I can actually change whether it's a left to right or right to left. I can swing that round to a hundred and eighty degrees. Let's just go back to the beginning and play one more time, and you'll notice what is happening with the frame. Okay, this is we're panning to the right, so eventually these trees will go out of frame, and a little bit more of the frame is appearing on the right hand side here. Now it's very slow and very progressive and obviously when this plays back at 25 frames per second it'll be a lot smoother. Okay, and obviously it's having to recache because each frame now is different from the memory before. And so when I play back we get quite a smooth fluid pan right. You definitely don't want to be at a frame rate slower than 24 frames per second if you do these post-production zooms or pans because they can be a little bit jerky if you try and slow down say 15 frames per second. Okay, let's go back um, to my other time lapse here and let's just uh, see what else we can do that's creative. I'm just going to remove those um, transitions there. Okay, just click on them and hit delete. Uh, and I'm going to create um, um, an adjustment layer that fades the movie from black and white to color over the duration of the clip. Okay, now if I was to pick up an adjustment layer from here, okay, let's just pick up a hue saturation. What you'll see is it gets linked or um, uh, clipped to our movie file. Now what will happen is if I make any adjustments uh, this adjustment will be applied across the entire duration of the movie clip. Now if I add um, uh, an adjustment layer with the video group closed then naturally it will just appear above the video group or alternatively I can click and drag this um, adjustment layer out of the video group. Okay, now what we'll see is the uh, adjustment layer appears as its own timeline. Let's just put the timeline back to the beginning by clicking on that first backward arrow there. So we reset it to the beginning. I'm just going to open up the hue saturation options to show you that we have options for position, opacity. We also have options over the, the, anything that we might have done with the layer mask of this adjustment layer. So we've got lots of creative options here. Okay, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, uh, start black and white. So we're just going to lower the saturation all of the way. And what I'm going to do is now click on this little alarm clock uh, next to opacity. And this puts in a little yellow diamond or keyframe onto the timeline that remembers the opacity of this adjustment layer should be at 100% at this point. If I move forward in the timeline, maybe to 80% um, of the way through the movie, and then change the opacity of the adjustment layer, I'll knock it down to 0%, what will happen over time, the adjustment layer will fade out from 100 to 0, and the color will come all of the way back in. So let's just click, um, go back to the beginning, and then click play, and you'll see that color come in over time okay and uh, and we'll be in full color by the time we hit the second keyframe right. now I won't have time to go fully into uh, the holy grail of time-lapse here but I'll just start uh, by just showing you uh, maybe some of the the limitations with time-lapse and how we can start to uh, overcome those Okay, now I did uh, say earlier that sometimes um, beginners will often use auto exposure when recording a sunrise or sunset for time lapse, but a, little, a few problems can occur when we do that. Okay, now professionals would prefer to be using manual even when the ambient light is changing and make those um, differences in exposure at a time where they feel appropriate. 
Okay. Now often this creates jumps in exposure or white balance and we can either handle that by slowly ramping those um, exposure changes over time or by managing those big jumps in post-production. Okay, now if we are shooting in RAW, we do have um, a certainly flexibility over white balance because that's not baked into a RAW file. We can modify over time so we can start cool and adjust uh, to a warmer white balance setting if required. We also have some exposure latitude as much as two stops. Okay, and um, we can um, slide the exposure over time and I'm going to show you how to do that uh, using no additional software other than just Photoshop. Now this, is, uh, this uh, slide shows you the problem of using auto um, a, a white balance and auto exposure. This is uh, only one frame apart in a sequence, frame 74 and frame 75. And if you carefully you'll notice that um, there's, a, there's a color shift and also an exposure shift between these two frames. And uh, so the camera can't really be trusted to slide the white balance and exposure gradually. We can still get um, bumps in, in exposure and white balance that uh, will create a sort of a flickering effect in the final uh, movie um, and the professionals try not to have those um, jumps. Okay, um, to show you this, so I've got uh, two frames here. Uh, they captured just 17 minutes apart. Now I'm using manual exposure, so the exposure is locked down from the beginning of the time lapse to the end. Now you can see uh, the huge, this is the same setting in Lightroom, but you can see the end exposure is much brighter and much cooler. Uh, but we can actually uh, modify that in post. So the, um, the exposure and white balance doesn't seem to shift quite so much. Okay, so there's the um, there's the end exposure re-edited. So it's much much closer to that first file. We've basically um, warmed it but warmed it up by 2,000 degrees Kelvin, and also reduced the exposure in Lightroom by two stops. And we can transition between the two. Okay, so let's just jump over to Photoshop because I've got one that I prepared earlier. And uh, let's, oops, it's called Southern Cross. Okay, basically what I've done is I've synchronized uh, all of the files so they're their optimum for the beginning as they are here. Okay, uh, we've got an optimum exposure. Now here you'll see a much darker movie on top. Okay, and that's the same file sequence but this time optimized for the end. Okay, so and as we can see there, that is uh, what I showed you in that um, slide there, is uh, it's the same um, settings for all of the camera, but this time I'm sliding between that 2000 degrees Kelvin difference and that two stop difference. Now I've processed all of the files so that they're optimum for the beginning at, um, here. Okay, and uh, it's very similar to that hue saturation adjustment. I'm fading between the two. Instead of an adjustment layer this time, because the adjustments are being done in, in Lightroom, is we're fading from 0% opacity, where this movie is too dark, to the second keyframe. And uh, so we'll just jump forward, click that forward arrow. And now the uh, movie is set at 100%. Okay, so. Um, just to reiterate, I'll go back to Lightroom, that can be slightly confusing. So I've just got a slide here which shows you that I've processed the movie so it's optimum for the beginning. And then I've processed uh, the same movie so it's optimum for the end. And I fade out, uh, okay, over time so I can fade between the optimum settings for each. Okay. Okay, and that is uh, generally uh, just what we've done. Okay, so um, obviously if we're trying to go from absolute uh, broad daylight to um, um, nighttime with stars, then that two-stop um, slide isn't going to be enough. And so we are going to have to employ um, additional help. Okay, there are hardware solutions uh, which uh, are called bulb ramping and there are software solutions and by far the most popular commercial software solution is a piece of software that works hand-in-hand -hand with Lightroom, hence it's called LR Timelapse or Lightroom Timelapse. 
maps and this helps to slide the uh, optimum uh, exposures. Uh, we might have actually jumped the exposure four, five, six, seven times in one stop increments and LR time lapse helps to transition that uh, so it's a liquid smooth transition. Okay, so uh, that really sums up uh, or gives you a, a lightning fast introduction to time lapse. Okay, hopefully you've learned something from this tutorial and uh, I'll see you online for the next one.